All right, so my disclosures. All right, the optimal time to give radium-223 is A, pre-chemo, B, post-chemo, or C, never. All right. So the objectives, uh, we're going to talk about the significance of bone mets. We're going to talk about the symptoms associated with bone mets. We're going to talk about a little bit about early identification, but Dr. Crawford already talked about that. We'll briefly talk about therapeutic layering because he already addressed that. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the details with regards to progression when it comes to radium-223 therapy. All right, so advanced prostate cancer, I, you know, I don't need to be telling you all this, but it's a disease that presides, predom resides predominantly in the bones. Um, malignant cells are widely disseminated in advanced prostate cancer, and, you know, we've seen those bone scans or any scan that shows that, that it's really widespread and involves the bones. Typically, we see uh, red marrow bones being most involved, and that includes spine, pelvis, and ribs. And it probably has something to do with blood flow and just nutrients, metabolism, and whatnot. Uh, but they also occur in the skull and long bones as well. And, you know, we'll occasionally see acrometastases in the, the fingers or, or, or feet or whatnot. But again, mostly in the axial and proximal appendicular skeleton. All right. So we know that prostate cancer has an affinity to bone, and I think the hypothesis or what we think is the bone matrix is rich in uh, factors that stimulate the growth of tumor cells and promotes a, a vicious cycle of metastases and bone pathology. So it's this whole idea of homeland, you know, they migrate to a host land, and again, there are a lot of these exosomes and other factors that really allows the bone to be, you know, a happy place for these prostate cancer cells. This is an interesting study, and it was published in Nature in 2015 that talked about the different migratory pathways of bone mets. Um, mets usually spread between distant sites rather than as separate waves from the primary tumor, and that was pretty interesting. Tumor cells sharing a common heritage travel from one site to another, and they retain their genetic imprint. Uh, and this whole idea supports a seed and soil theory about uh, subclones developing the potential to metastasize. So, you know, if you look at these different colors, you see where they originate from. And again, not everything comes from the primary prostate. It can come from other, you know, bone lesions and whatnot. So I think this idea leads to the idea that maybe we should be treating the bones a little earlier to prevent this uh, from seeding other places. This is what we also know is we know that disease tends to get more aggressive and worse as you go from lymph nodes to bone to visceral disease and then bone plus visceral disease. You know, so, uh, yeah, I guess visceral disease is something that we are always very fearful of and something that um, we know at that point the disease is much more aggressive. All right. What we also know is the fact that multiple symptoms are associated with bone mets. And, you know, we've talk, heard about this a little earlier, but I think we really need to expand our thoughts of symptom, symptoms beyond just bone pain. And what we actually see, and this I think comes from a, a, a survey that Dr. Shore had completed, is that fatigue is actually the most stressful symptom of which patients with MRC, MCRPC complain about. But we see a lot of other symptoms, interference with sleep, dyspnea, impaired mobility, difficulties uh, doing their daily activities. Uh, and even from my own personal experience, a lot of these patients come in and, and I, I don't know if it's a, a machismo thing, but they just don't want to say it's pain, you know. But we do realize that you know, these, there are other ways that in which prostate cancer affects our patients besides pain. And if we wait for pain, it's too late. Nearly seven to 10 patients ignore their symptoms. So healthcare professionals need to focus on and be more proactive with discussing symptoms uh, because symptoms are typically being underreported. The most common symptoms in our patients with advanced prostate cancer include fatigue, a body pain or aches, numbness or weakness, difficulty sleeping, difficulty do doing normal activities, anxiety, uh, vomiting, and loss of appetite. We talked about this. You know, I think this is important. You know, and when we first developed this, it was based on bone scans and CT, but now we have better imaging. So I think there's no question we'll be detecting uh, metastatic disease sooner. But I think it's up to all of us to be looking and finding the best strategy for your own practice to detect metastatic disease. And again, you know, leads to this idea of layering. And we saw this, but uh, so just quickly is p just the idea of layering things on top of each other, I think. Um, and really, it goes back to the whole idea of finding the right patient and treating them at the right time. So we have patients with bone mets, and we have to identify those bone mets. 
And we also then have to identify the signs and symptoms. And again, expand our, our, our perception of symptomatology beyond just pain to include things like fatigue, impaired mobility, et cetera. And then layer radium-223 on top of a second generation androgen inhibitor when PSA rises. And as we heard from Drs. Crawford and Bryce, you know, I still see that a lot of time where a patient will be on Abby and then switch to enzalutamide when we know that doesn't work. You know, so the idea here is to then, all right, if the patient's on a second generation, their PSA goes up, you know, think about radium at that point if they have symptomatic bone metastases. Again, that's the key, symptomatic bone meds. You know, once you make the decision to start, I think it's important that we, ha we stay with this idea of completing therapy. Uh, and this comes from Dr. Sarder, who presented this at ASCO in 2015, that, you know, he found that patients with less prior therapy had a greater chance of completing more cycles. And the clinical parameters which reflect early disease stage were associated with more likelihood of completing therapy. And this comes from uh, the Farber, talks about concurrent ABI and previous CIPT as associate, being associated with patients receiving all five to six therapies. And this is likely because they were earlier in their disease course. Why is that important? It's important because, you know, the data that we're seeing so far from the expanded access trials and, and you know, other studies, and this was presented at ASCO in 2015 and published in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine in 2015, is that total radium cycles and ABI in this one study were associated with improved overall survival, improved progression-free survival, and improved bone event-free survival. Um, there was higher mortality in patients in the group of patients receiving less than five doses versus those who received greater than five doses. So for those of you who aren't familiar, when we start this, it's, it's set, supposed to be six total doses every four weeks. So it's actually a total of five months. Uh, so it's very important for patients to get to at least five and ideally six of these therapies. So, you know, I tell this to all the patients when they start, you know, we're here and, you know, we're committed. We need to commit to finishing, but obviously we want to make sure we're safe throughout that whole process. Imaging, you know, I think is very important in this idea of progression, but I think we also need to be careful. And a lot of times we think, you know, obviously radiology, we think imaging is everything, but it's really not. I think it only tells a part of the story. So it's one way to assess for progression, not the only way. And that's why when Dr. Crawford was talking about um, the RADAR2 recommendations, it made a lot of sense that we included more than just imaging. You know, conv convincing consistent rise in PSA, radiographic progression, and clinical symptoms while on therapy. You know, I think it's hard just to take one of these and say, hey, this patient is progressing. And it really takes the art of medicine for, for physicians and advanced practice providers to, to assess this and not rely on just one, you know, bone scan or one CT as progression. So this, these are the APPC recommendations from the St. Gallen Convention in March of 2017 uh, this year. And it provides sort of a guideline with regards to how you should manage your patients who are getting radium-223. And at each visit, it makes sense that you'd want to assess their clinical symptoms. Um, you actually want to also assess total alkaline phosphatase, phosphatase at every visit. And what we're seeing from you know, data from the Alcinco trial and, and the expanded access trial is that alkaline phosphatase is probably a better biomarker for patients' response and their prognosis uh, while undergoing radium-223 therapy. LDH is another secondary marker. Personally, we don't use that too often, but, you know, if there's ever a discordance between some of the different, you know, biomarkers, LDH might help as well. You're obviously going to want to check the hematologic parameters every, every month. So we tend to require a CBC seven days of their scheduled therapy. And patients at baseline, they need um, platelets greater than 100,000, uh, ANC greater than 1.5, um, and a hemoglobin greater than 10. For doses two, to th two through six, their hemoglobin uh, does not matter. They need ANC greater than one and platelets greater than 50. So the actual requirements for the subsequent doses actually go down in terms of your um, platelets and your ANC values. PSA. So PSA, we routinely check at baseline, and they recommend this too, and they check it at follow-up. I think the idea of checking a PSA in between is kind of optional. And I think it's because we know that PSA is going up. I think if we 
if you're aware of what this PSA does while on this therapy, I think it's safe to go ahead and get a PSA. I think there is some value to a PSA in the sense that if it really rises rapidly, it might give you some pause and, and, and time to think about maybe is this patient progressing in other ways? Are they having, do they have new visceral metastases? Uh, but again, that's really up to your own practice how you want to track these. But again, a rise in PSA is something we expect. So imaging. Typically, we'll do imaging at baseline, and this is what they recommend as well. And we'll do it in follow-up. And follow-up CT scan here is optional according to the APPC guidelines. Patients, you know, when we first started, we used to do bone scans and CTs after their third dose. But what we found was that it really wasn't very helpful. A lot of these patients, you know, their bone scan after three cycles looked a little worse. And the question was, was that flare? Uh, was it just the bony response to the disease being treated, which is a good thing? And we know that flare is a good thing in, in many cases. Or was it real progression? And I think it created a lot of anxiety in physicians and in patients. So personally, I just don't think it's worth the added money, added time to get a bone scan in between. CT scan as well. You know, if the patient's cruising along, feels great, you know, I don't think there's a reason to get a PSA. I mean, we've had some patients with remarkable responses. The first patient we treated in Colorado was literally hitting golf balls, you know, that afternoon when he had never hit golf, played golf in the past three months. Uh, we had another patient recently who came in in a wheelchair and left uh, and bought a Harley after his third cycle. So that was our own biomarker that he was healthy, uh, healthier, not healthy. Uh, but uh, again, those types of responses aren't the norm. Um, but again, so for CT scans, I personally think it's more valuable to assess the patient, see how they're doing. If you, there is a clinical concern that the patient developed visceral metastatic disease during that time, yeah, then a CT scan with contrast is absolutely indicated. Changes in management, you know, we heard about this, but it's, it's important to reiterate this the fact that, you know, we need to be aware of the different mechanisms of action um, and understand why we're doing things and what their options are. So if they do have PSA progression, think about it. You know, re-image as you feel necessary and then alter and layer um, as you feel necessary. So in summary, it's real important to identify the right patient. Uh, and that includes looking for metastatic disease. And number two, doing a thorough history to, to evaluate symptomatology. And it's pr pretty ironic that a radiologist is talking about thorough histories, but I apologize. Uh, and then layer at the right time. Um, and then lastly, when you start on this path, just commit, if possible, to getting five to six. Because I think one of the things that's always a shame is for a patient to start down this course, only make it to three, two, three, four doses, and then fall out. Personally, if we have a patient who, you know, looks that sick and we don't think they're going to get to five or six, I mean, you know, the question is, do we even start? So I think that's something to think about. But if we're thinking this a little earlier in disease, you know, and layering it on top when the PSA rises while they're on a second generation uh, antiandrogen, you know, I think the chances of, of finishing five to six go up much higher. All right, um, optimal time to give radium 223 is. All right, great, thank you.